So today we start a two-week uh, series uh, about love, about loving relationships, loving our relationships. I think we all know it isn't always easy to stay loving in relationships. You know, it kind of reminds me of one of my favorite jokes. It's an oldie but a goodie. Here it comes. So this married couple had a really, really bad fight and argument. And they were so upset after it that neither one wanted to talk to each other. They were giving each other the silent treatment. Two days go by, not a peep from either one with no uh, talking or speaking in sight. On the third day, the husband remembers he's got to take a business uh, flight at 6 a.m. the next morning, and he's got to get up at 4 a.m., and he has a really hard time getting up, even with an alarm that early. He needs his wife's help. So, not wanting to uh, be the first one to speak and needing her help, he writes her a note that says, please wake me at 4 a.m. to catch an important uh, flight for an important meeting, and puts it at her uh, night table where she'd see it. And then the next morning, uh, he wakes up at 6 a.m. and he's missed his flight. And he is ticked and upset that his wife didn't wake him up. And before he could go to find her, he saw a note on his side of the bed that said, wake up, it's four o'clock. And so... Um, <laughs> so how many people would agree that relationships are sometimes challenging, difficult, and even frustrating? Anybody agree with that? And who would also agree that relationships can be wonderful, nurturing, and fulfilling. Amen to that as well. So my question for you is, are you a master of love? Or how many people would like to be more masterful in your expression and experience of love? Okay, about five or six of us. That's pretty good. <laughs> you know, in his book, uh, The Mastery of Love, Don Miguel Ruiz says that we are all masters. And the reason we are masters is every one of us has the power to create our lives and everything in it. We create ourselves, he says. You know, we create our personalities and we particularly create who we believe we are. Because who we believe we are really impacts all areas of our lives. Sometimes some of us believe we're victims. Some believe that we are successful. Some believe that we aren't good enough or unworthy. Some believe that we're bad in relationships. Some believe that we're lucky in love. Some uh, believe uh, that we're happy. Some believe that we're lonely or that we're shy or that we're beautiful or that we're insecure. You know, the fact is that, that we create our beliefs and especially the belief of who we are and that really guides and attracts so many of the experiences and relationships in our lives. You know, he gives this example that uh, uh, there's a child and there's some problem uh, or situation that isn't working out well. The child gets angry. Somehow the problem seems to go away and they get what they want and they see that and then it happens again. Problem, anger, resolve. They get what they want and they begin to what he says, begin to believe that about themselves and to begin to master anger as their go-to response and one of their tools of how they live life. And he said, we create, practice, and master all kinds of things like jealousy or self-rejection or feelings of sadness or unworthiness. He said, all of the suffering and all the drama in our lives are all a creation from ourselves that we have practiced and, and mastered. And it's for all things, not, you know, not just the challenging things, but it's, it's for all things, our level of happiness and success and also love that we have created and practiced and mastered whatever level of love we think we're worthy of. So I want you to think of your main relationship or your relationships and think about the amount of love in your life. And I bet every one of us probably would like to experience more love or a greater level of love. And the good news is that since we created, practiced, and developed a level of mastery, we can actually recreate and practice higher levels of love and move to mastering greater levels of love in our lives. So that's what we're gonna look at over the next two weeks. Today, we're gonna to look at seven practices that we could have to increase the level of love to move to the greater um, experience of mastering love. So the first step in our increasing uh, love in our relationships um, is that we have to work on ourselves. You know, when we want a relationship to get better and improve or be happier, um, um, we usually think it, me it usually means that we want the other person to change. You know, we want the other person to improve. They want the other person to get better. We want the other person to wake up and get with it. AKA, we want the other person to do exactly what we want them to do and be the way we want them to be. 
You know, and one of the reasons I think we want the other person to change is at some level, I think we believe that the people in our lives and particularly our most important relationship, uh, is, that person is there to make us happy. That, you know, at some level, I think we're thinking, hey, you are supposed to complete me, and right now I'm not feeling so complete, so you really need to do a better job on your end to make this work. And so, Don Miguel Ruiz says that happiness can only come from within ourselves and is the result of our own love. You know, partners certainly have a, a role to play. There's no question. But with the belief that that person has to change, being the necessary answer for our happiness and our relationship to work is not, um, uh, is not a winning proposal at all. If we truly, truly want to experience more love in our relationship, we have to work on ourselves. We have to look within that if we are feeling a lack of love or stuck or in conflict or disconnected, it is a reflection of something within ourselves, you know, some fear or wound that is in ourselves that needs healing, that needs acceptance, that needs to be released and transformed in some way. And to find out what's going on with us that's blocking or preventing us from experiencing higher levels of love, we have to look at some of the patterns in our lives. You know, what are some of the common struggles we have in relationship? Or what are the similar arguments we keep having or experience we keep having of, of getting hurt or whatever else? And looking at patterns of things like how we respond, like maybe shutting down or pushing away or, uh, or even uh, running away. You know, and the thing is, we need to be honest with ourselves of what's really going on with us and what some of those patterns are and to look towards ourselves and not others and see what our role is and how we're participating in perpetuating these situations. And once we get clear with that, working on ourselves is to take it to God, that we really need to open our hearts to feel God's love and allow God's love to cleanse and to refresh and to renew and to heal and transform us so that we can get to a place where we feel whole in God's love we feel a sense of wholeness with our own love, that, that, that love within fills us um, by ourselves. Because the more we take our uh, hearts and our love to God and open to ourselves, that is the only way we can increase our capacity to give and receive love uh, in our lives. You know, there's an abundance of love within us and around us that's available. And when we do it, you know, and we do this, more love comes. And it wasn't like it wasn't there before. It's just we were blocking it you know, in, in the ways that we have fears or woundedness that, that hold us back. You know, one of the things if we're really serious about increasing the level of love in our relationship is to not like looking at our partner be the automatic knee-jerk reaction of how things can get better. Because it really is about how we create love, how we practice love, and how we master higher and newer levels of love. So if we want to master love, we want more love in our lives, we need to work on ourselves and cultivate and connect with the love within ourselves. The second one is that we need to, um, we need to pay attention. You know, Linda and Charlie Bloom in their blog, Stronger at the Broken Places, says, more marriages die of neglect and a lack of attention than of irreconcilable differences. You know, like everything else in life, for every relationship needs to be nurtured. It needs to be given uh, attention. You know, somebody said that in life you're either expanding or contracting, we're either thriving uh, or, or we're dying. And in relationships, attention is an important thing that needs uh, to be paid. You know, these guys are saying that sometimes we spend more money and maintenance on our cars and work and, uh, on our relationships that we never think about driving 50,000 miles on our car before an oil change, yet we can sometimes go for months without um, saying I love you or having a heart-to-heart -heart talk or taking time just to spend it one-on-one -on -one, uh, with one another or having a fun uh, getaway together. The thing about attention is two things. One is to pay attention and just notice uh, that our partner of what's going on. Are they tired? Are they looking stressed? Sometimes we don't are in the same house, in the same place, and we're not tuned in. And so sometimes just paying attention of what's going on and how things are is important. And the other one is to give our attention. Like one of the greatest gifts we can give someone in life is to give them our undivided attention. Because to give someone atten our attention means that we're present, that we're interested, that we're engaged, that we want to hear and listen to what's going on uh, in their lives. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi said, whatever you put your attention on will grow stronger in your life. 
So that if we put our attention on our love and on our relationship, that it will grow into greater levels of happiness and love. The third one is uh, in relationships to increase the love is to address our problems when they come up. You know, most of us, when it comes to problems and particularly in relationship, we rather kind of put it off, uh, put it to the side, sweep it under the rug, hope it just magically gets better uh, on its own. But the truth is, um, most uh, difficult problems in a relationship get harder over time uh, than get easier. You know, sometimes just acknowledging these difficult things um, earlier, even if they're uncomfortable, is much healthier than waiting because things can fester. You know, things can uh, get uh, even worse when we ignore or pretend. You know, somebody said, pain denied is pain prolonged. You know, and, 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 and so even if it's uncomfortable, we need to address these things. You know, and it's easier than we think. You know, telling someone the truth in a way that's not shaming or blaming um, or disrespectful can often bring uh, couples closer together, individuals in any kind of relationships better. You know, but when we, when we put it off, it can actually create more distance, you know, more disconnect and, and more bitterness. And I read something that, that really surprised me and it said, the average couple has already been in trouble for six years before they seek marriage counseling. I don't know, does that sound surprising? Or, but the point is, is that the putting things off is really not a healthy thing. It's, it's good and important to work on it together, but it's good and important to sometimes see when it's not working that we might need some help to try and navigate through some of the challenges to get to a place of healing and greater connection. The next one is, um, is to learn to forgive, number four. You know, inevitably in any life, in any relationship, work or uh, more intimate relationship, someone's gonna say something that's hurtful, someone's gonna say something that's unkind or insensitive, and nothing erodes a relationship quicker than holding a grudge and being resentful and feeling blame and bitterness. And it's poisonous, and it can be very, very destructive in any uh, relationship. And even though there are always going to be disappointments or hurts or irritations, you know, having the willingness and the desire to forgive, to release, and to heal those uh, hurts and upsets and, and emotions is a vital and important thing. And sometimes, sometimes we think, oh, I'll never be able to forgive, or how do I forgive? The truth is, the number one thing about forgiveness, I always say, is are you willing? Are you willing to forgive? Are you willing to let go of that pain? You know, and are you willing to have an intention to be healed? And are you willing to allow God to help you heal your heart? To, help, to allow God to help dissolve and remove you know, that pain and that uh, bitterness. You know, I absolutely believe that forgiveness is one of the greatest acts of love. It is an act of self-love, of saying, I'm not gonna keep punishing myself with anger and resentment and hate. You know, instead, I'm gonna to choose to be loving to myself, forgive so I can experience peace, so I can experience a, a, a greater sense of happiness and joy. And it's the same in the relationship. Forgiveness is an act of love, to be able to, to let go of that stuff, to feel a sense of healing and wholeness so that the relationship could move on in the healthiest way possible. So, number five, in increasing love in our relationship is take time to play and have fun. You know, sometimes we're so busy, we don't take time for ourselves, we don't take time for each other. And just doing anything, like hiking and biking or doing yoga or working out or going to a play or a concert or a comedy club or um, taking cooking lessons or wine tasting or dancing or going to the spa and having a massage and a mani-pedi together or something, whatever it is you think might be fun. I know some couples do date nights and stuff, and these things are vital and important. You know, from the grind and stress of all the work and responsibilities, it's important to plan out time, personal time, connecting time, to find that childlike joy, to find that love and playfulness in the relationship uh, again. And so that, that's number five. Number six is the willingness to, to share your vulnerability. You know, being vulnerable for most of us is a little scary. You know, if I share this much of myself, will I regret it? Will I you know, be embarrassed? Will they think I'm foolish? But on the other side of vulnerability is connection and an intimacy and a closeness and an understanding that can bring people closer and to experience deeper levels of love and understanding of each other. And the thing about the vulnerability, it could be anything. 
It could be anything that's going on in your life right now. It could be something that happened in the past. It could be some regret. It could be some secret dream or desire that you have, something happy, something sad. It doesn't matter. What does matter, it is something that's vital and important to you, something sacred to you that you want to share openly uh, with the person in your life. It is amazing the power of vulnerability. You know, the example I want to give you is actually not in a relationship, but it's actually my relationship with my dad. My dad was a very serious guy. And he, I always say, he had a man face. At 11, he looked like a man. And not just any man, a serious man. He just looked like that. You know, my dad, I only knew him as a serious guy. He was fun sometimes, but vulnerable is not something I would ever assume about my dad. He always had two jobs, he had 10 kids, he was working hard. You know, he didn't have a lot of warm fuzzies oozing off him like my mom. And so there were three incidents in my dad's life, I remember him being vulnerable, that really caught me by surprise and amazed me and made a difference to me. When I was four years old, my father had a nervous breakdown and was uh, hospitalized for a while. And he had electroshock therapy and he was away from, from the family for a while. And so that was at four. And I'd heard about something like that but when I was in my mid-twenties, we're sitting around and out of the blue, my father talks about his hospitalization, brings it up out of the blue and what it was like to be away from the family, what it was like to go through that experience. And I'd never seen it in my dad about anything except strong. And so to see him vulnerable and sharing about his process, you know, was something that really struck me. And I didn't see him as weak. It actually helped me understand him and I appreciated uh, and realized all that he went through. Um, and, it, and it just made me feel closer and more connected to him. It was, it was an amazing experience. Another one was a, he shared an experience of when he was a, a kid. He was about 13 or 14. His father had a, a little store. And one of his customers brought a bag of fruit. They're called baladas. They're from, you know, they're in Latin America. Well, let's call them cherries here. They're, they're the Caribbean cherries. And... Um, Anyway, and, and they were kind of rare and really delicious and a little expensive. And so my dad, seeing this, thought, why not just take one? He took one, then he took two, and he took three or four or five. He was loving these things and enjoying it. And he thought to himself, you know what? I'm going to get in trouble for taking a few of these. So I might as, get in tr- I may as, might as, get, I might as well get in trouble and eat all of them. And... <laughs> And if you knew my dad, we were howling. All the kids were howling at him and, uh, and, and the way he told his story. But again, we felt closer and connected to this serious man who was a great provider. And then the last one was just a couple of years before he died. We bought this like cassette recorder and my sisters were talking into it and we were playing around with it. And then they sang, you know, going to the chapel, going to get married, some song like that. And out of a little joke, they said, hey, dad, want to sing a song? And he said, yes. My father gave a heartfelt rendition to uh, Strangers in the Night that we couldn't even believe it. In fact, he sang with us. The only thing I ever heard my father sing was Happy Birthday. I mean, that was the only thing. And so I don't know where this came from. And we actually, as soon as he finished singing it, we pressed play and, and listened to him sing it again on the recording. We were so moved and touched. And so the one thing I want to say, vulnerability is risky, but the payoff is incredible. Our willingness and our desire to share a piece of ourselves, something sacred, something playful, something we dare not generally share is a vital and important thing to be closer in a relationship. I would say it's one of the, of these seven things, one of the most powerful to bring people closer together and to feel more connection. Because I bet in many relationships, the people we're closest to, there are things that we haven't shared with them, things we want to share with them, but we hold ourselves back because we're afraid to be vulnerable. And the final one is to cherish and appreciate uh, the people in our lives and all of our relationships. You know, when people love us and they're always there for us, it's easy to take them for granted, isn't it? They're kind of always there. They always seem happy. Everything seems cool. But the fact is, everybody wants to feel cherished and appreciated. Nobody wants to feel that they're taken for granted. You know, and, and, and to feel cherished and appreciated means that you feel cared for. You feel valued. You feel uh, affirmed, you know, you, uh, you, you feel nurtured. And it is such an important and powerful gift. Do you know research shows that when we express gratitude to someone, it triggers uh, what they call the love hormone, uh, oxytocin in us, that 
He was responsible for helping us build connection uh, and closeness and bonds between people. You know, three of the most powerful things we could ever say, thank you, I appreciate you, and I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful, and all those can be for all things, but especially in relationships, to express our gratitude and appreciation there is important. Now, it's easier to appreciate and cherish someone for all the things we love about them, but it's a little harder to appreciate for the things that are really different about them. But every single relationship, no matter how much people love each other or how much we think we're similar, there are always going to be differences. Differences in the way we communicate, our perspective, and those things have to be learned to be appreciated as well. I bet some of you either in relationships or no relationship where someone is a morning person and someone is a night owl. Someone is adventurous and daring, someone is a little more uh, conservative. You know, someone is punctual, someone is always running late. Someone is really organized, someone is really disorganized. Anybody ever have that in your relationship? Those are there for a reason. When they say opposites attract, it's for a reason. To help expand our capacity to love. To love even though they don't do it the way we do it. You know, to appreciate uh, you know, and to cherish that there are different ways of doing things in life. And that person is in your life to love and celebrate you in those good ways, but show you differences to expand your capacity to love. You know, I saw a quote and it says, differences are in inevitable, but conflict is optional. So with differences, we need to learn how to appreciate them, how to respect, how to honor, even though it's different, because that's all a huge part of deepening and expanding the level of love in our relationships and in our lives. The greatest commandment is to love. Love God. Love others as we love ourselves. You know, Apostle Paul said, love is the fulfilling of the law. Love is the deal the thing we all want and need. And love is hard. It ain't easy. It's challenging us and it stretches us every which way. But guess what? We are creators and we can create greater levels of love, practice those levels of love, and master those levels of love to feel greater levels of fulfillment. You know, so the, the seven things are work on ourselves. Look here first when anything's going on. See what might need to be healed and released and expand God's love in our hearts. Second is pay attention. Pay attention to what might be going on with the other person and then give your attention. You know, three is to address it sooner. Don't let it fester. Get help if you need it. Talk about it. Bring it out so, so it doesn't be, be, become a, a bigger problem. Take time to have fun. Go do things together. Whatever you like to do, go do some stuff. You know, share your vulnerability. Share a piece of yourself, even if it's risky. You know, share it with yourself because I guarantee you it'll bring closeness and understanding. And finally, uh, cherish and appreciate the things you love and adore about them and learn to appreciate the things that are different about them because they all help us experience greater levels of love. If we all want to have more love, we got the power to create. We got the power um, to practice and master love. God bless you all.